Uh, welcome to the tenuous line between fiction and non-fiction. Our panelists today, uh, on my immediate left, is Rob Crilly. Uh, Rob is a British and Irish freelance journalist and an author. He was educated at Dowling College, Cambridge. He is currently the Pakistan correspondent for the Daily Telegraph, having previously been in the East Af at the East African correspondent for the Times. He has also written for the Irish Times, the Daily Mail, and the Christian Science Monitor. Uh, Rob Crilly's book, Saving Darfur, Everyone's Favorite African War, based on four years of reporting on Sudan and extensive travels through the region, was published in February 2010. Um, at the end there is H.M. Nakvi. H.M. Nakvi is the award-winning author of the novel Homeboy. He has worked in the financial services industry, run a slam venue, and taught creative writing at Boston University. He has received the DSC Prize for South Asian Literature, the Phelan Prize for Poetry, and has participated in the Brooklyn Book Festival, the Jaipur Literature Festival, Art Dubai, Lollapalooza, and the IWP residency at the University of Iowa. Based in Karachi, he is currently working on his second novel, which is really fantastic, by the way. Um, I thought I would begin the panel by framing a couple of the issues involved in thinking through what this tenuous line is between fiction and nonfiction, um, uh, and a short overview of perhaps the ways in which historians and writers have talked about fiction and fact. Um, if we go back, right, when we turn to, the, the conventional vision suggests that we turn to the historical record for factual understandings of the past, and to to journalism for factual understandings of the present. But the historical, historical record is replete with imaginative license. The father of history, Herodotus, invented vivid recreations of the Greco-Persian Wars, accounts of battles, speeches, conversations to which he clearly had no access. After him, Thucydides, perhaps more scientific in his careful sifting of evidence, even he fills in the gaps with oral testimonies and eyewitness accounts that aren't entirely reliable. Geoffrey of Monmouth create, wrote an entirely creative history of medieval England, which was for many, many generations thought to be true, and this, the, the reason this is important will become apparent in one second. Uh, uh, Raphael Hollinshead, who was a chronicler of medieval history, borrowed heavily from Geoffrey of Monmouth's imaginative fictional history of medieval England, and Shakespeare drew on Raphael Hollinshead's chronicles for almost all of his history plays. Edward Gibbon, who wrote a magisterial account of the history and f of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, is filled with factual inadequacies, unsupported assertions. Okay? On the other hand, scholars of literature continue to, uh, continue to believe that we learn more truth about the past from Homer, Virgil, Shakespeare, and the like. Emily Dickinson in one poem once said, tell all the truth, but tell it slant. Success in circuit lies. Marion Moore in a poem called Poetry said, literature is about creating imaginative gardens with real toads in them. Okay? Arguments continue about whether the Trojan War really happened, whether Rome was founded by Aeneas. Torquato Tasso's epic rendering of the First Crusade in Jerusalem liberated Firdosi's account of Persian history in the Shah Nama. Abu Fazl's Akbar Nama, Shakespeare's history plays, contain, we are told, many profound truths about the human condition, even though their accounts are mostly fiction. Okay. In the 20th century, this problem becomes increasingly complicated. Okay? Linguists in the early part of the 20th century developed theories about language that suggested that the very words that we use to describe experience are essentially unstable and unreliable. That all reading and all understanding is misunderstanding and misreading, and that eyewitnesses and oral testimonies are always partial and often blind. Okay? With the rise and proliferation of a culture of the image, the development of both historical fiction and the nonfiction novel, Hollywood's imaginative re uh, recreations of the past in its blockbuster epics, these have all worked to help make fiction and fact indistinguishable. So, in this age of Fox News and reality TV, where truth is merely a matter of opinion, is it even possible to make this distinction? Does this tenuous line even exist? And I turn it over to the two of you. Uh, 
Uh, well, shall I, I'll kick things off then and just say how nice it is to be here. Um, uh, last year on the Sunday afternoon, I was driving to the airport and got a phone call saying a panellist had dropped out of a session. Could I possibly uh, act as a stand-in? <laughs> um, that person was George Galloway. So I told my driver to step on it and made my rather polite excuses. Um, I think that would be a, probably a sackable offence at the Telegraph to be a George Galloway stand-in. So it's nice to be here as myself. Um, although, given what we've just heard about the problem of separating uh, fact from fiction, I'm not quite sure what it says about my reputation as a journalist uh, to be <laughs> in, invited to sit on this uh, panel. But, but, uh, but I think I know, I know the reason why I was invited, because I know that H.M. Nackvi and I have um, discussed some of these questions um, uh, late, late into the night. Um, and, um, I, and I think that by considering the way I do my journalism and, and thinking about the novels I like and um, recent experiences of the way that non-fiction has dealt with a, a certain number of stories, I think there's some interesting questions to raise um, about exactly um, where you draw that line. And I think the, 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 the starting point for, for me would be that as a, as a, as a journalist and a writer of, of non-fiction, I, I share a lot of things in common with H.M. Nackvi, and, and that is that we love stories, we love reading them, and we love telling them. And that, and that is true of both fiction um, and non-fiction. Non Ultimately, we're in the same business of telling a story that illuminates the truth uh, in, in some way. And, you know, and that, in some ways, I think is, is obvious. I mean, I used to write for the Daily Mail. You don't need to know much about the Daily Mail to know that Lady Macbeth stories uh, of, of women manipulating husbands behind the scene, uh, of uh, trying to push them onto greater things and manipulating the men around them, uh, make up something like 25% of the all Daily Mail stories. <laughs> um, and I think that just as, uh, as, as novelists are, are, are seeking um, the truth uh, and, and share some things with non-fiction writers, uh, non-fiction writers use a lot of the tricks of the, the novelist or, or, the, or the fiction writer to, to make their point. And uh, there was one particular example I wanted to raise, which is connected with 9-11, and I know that HM will push back against this a little bit because we don't want to have yet another discussion of 9-11 in Pakistan and what it all means. But I think it does say something interesting about the relationship between fiction and, uh, and non-fiction. And this is the introduction to the 9-11 the Commission report, which could have been a very dry and, and, and turgid uh, paper, the result of uh, a, a long and lengthy uh, investigation interviewing hundreds and hundreds of people. This is how they began it. Uh, Tuesday, September the 11th, 2001, dawn temperate and nearly cloudless in the eastern United States. Millions of men and women readied themselves for work. For those heading to an airport, weather conditions could not have been better for a safe and pleasant journey. Among the travelers were Mohammed Atta and Abdul Atiza Alomari, who arrived at the airport in Portland, Maine. Now, I'd love to write a novel, and I find it incredibly difficult. <laughs> if I could start it like that, I think I'd be onto something. And, and I think that's a very sort of, sort of clear example of, of the way that um, non-fiction can, can read like a novel. And I, and I picked this example of 9-11 for good reason, because I think that um, it, it illustrates something of, of, of the, the tension between fiction and non-fiction. The, 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 the books I sort of turned to after 9-11 to help me understand what had happened were almost exclusively non-fiction. I wasn't interested uh, in, in writing fictional accounts of what had happened on that day. Uh, I turned to books like Ghost Wars by Steve Cole or, or, or The Looming Tower by, by Lawrence Wright. Uh, and I, I wasn't alone in that. I, mean, I just looked at The Guardian done on the 10th anniversary, did a, um, a list of the, the, the best uh, 20 books dealing with 9-11. And of those 20, I tallied them up, and, and three were novels. 17 were works of non-fiction in, in some way. And that's not... I mean, that's not just um, a, a, a quirk, an, an anomaly of, of the sampling or anything. I think that novelizing events like 9-11 is, is incredibly difficult um, for the reason that, as, as Mark Twain has ever had the right sort of um, uh, words for it, he, I mean, he said something along the lines of truth, truth is stranger than fiction. Um, fiction has to deal with possibilities. Um, tr truth doesn't. Um, so, I in other words, the events of 9-11, to me, it seemed, were just so odd and so strange that it became very difficult for novelists or fiction writers to actually build a plausible plot or set of ca characters around it. We, we simply didn't believe what they were writing. Now, that's not to say 9-11 hasn't produced a lot of very interesting literature, but maybe dealing with issues of um, racial identity, religious identity, um, uh, H.M. Nackvi's homeboy, you know, obviously touches on uh, life in New York after 9-11. So, but in terms of actually getting inside the terrorist's mind, um, uh, I and, and I think many other people have turned to, to non-fiction. And this is where, if, if, if so far, what we've talked about is confusing that line between fiction and non-fiction, um, in that they're both seeking truth, um, they both operate in, in similar ways. I mean, I think this brings me to where I see the distinction. 
And it's about the relationship between the writer and his or her book with the reader, which is that non-fiction clearly attempts to describe reality in a way that fiction doesn't. Fiction may have truth at its core, but the writer is telling you, here's a made-up story. And, and they have to make it plausible in order for you to buy into it. The non-fiction writer doesn't have to do it. It's a bunch of facts. And those facts could be wrong. They could actually be fabricated. But they're telling you, here is the truth. Believe it. If you don't want to believe it, you can walk away. But if you, if you don't believe in a novel, you're not going to read it. It's failed. It, 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 it doesn't exist anymore. So, so for me, there is, a very, there is a very tenuous line between fiction and non-fiction. But I think if you examine the relationship between the reader and the writer, you can start to understand where the, where the distinction lies. And, that, and that's my view, anyway. HM? This, uh, the, um, the, the title of this um, uh, panel um, might have been better served it were, if it were the relationship between fact and fiction as, as Rob has uh, incisively sort of uh, spoken about. Um, every sort of historical event, vicissitude, uh, produces a body of literature. So I, you know, going back, not to the, uh, not back to Herodotus, but uh, in recent history, World War One, World War Two, the Holocaust, partition, and uh, and 9/11. So novelists have um, contended with reality, with. Uh, mm, uh, with with these political vicissitudes, historical vicissitudes, um, because we inhabit this world and we are concerned with the world we inhabit, um, I I contend with um, with reality in a very different way. I'll come at this question or or this matter uh, as a novelist and. You know, as a novelist, I fundamentally lack imagination. I cannot conjure a story out of thin air. Uh, James Joyce uh, also said he lacked imagination. He wrote a story uh, in Rob's Neck of the Woods that took place within the confines of a day, within the confines of a very familiar neighborhood. Um, and in that way, I also um, have to rely on reality in a, in, a, in, a, in a very substantive way. For instance, in Homeboy, the protagonist um, finds himself out of a job and uh, drives a taxi cab. Now, the, the pages that deal with his, um, his uh, career as a New York cabbie are perhaps three or four, but I spent three or four weeks with New York cabbies. Um, I stayed where they stayed, ate where they ate, drove around with them. And I had to get the texture of the reality of, of this ethos, of, this, um, of, of, the, of the New York cabbie life right. Um, because I couldn't rely on my imagination. And, you know, I discovered through my investigation, for instance, that cabbies carry talisman. So a, a Hindu cabbie would have a picture of Ganesh on his, uh, uh, on his, uh, uh, on, 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 the, on the dashboard. And um, a, uh, a Haitian would have some sort of um, talisman that is associated with voodoo. Um, uh, Muslims, of course, uh, carried perhaps the Ayatul Kursi. Um, these seem to be, you know, fairly obvious, um, obvious things, but one glosses over it when you're sitting in the back seat. Um, for my next novel, um, which is set in Karachi, um, there is a scene that is set, let's say, in Garden East. So. I, you know, my, my Dadyal hails from Papoosh Nagar and my Nanyal, when they arrived here, were uh, near uh, Patel Park. I didn't spend a hell of a lot of time in Garden East. And so what I did was walk the streets 
and I would find a house that would strike me. And I would ask uh, the boys loitering outside playing cricket, who does this house belong to and how do I get in? And I would somehow get into the house and talk to the residents because the residents of Garden East and these, these you know, the, the house, some of the houses there are more than 100 years old. Um, and I would, and, and, and at first, the sort of the inhabitants would be wary of, of talking to me. But uh, slowly they would open up and tell stories about, um, of taking a, uh, a horse cart to Malir uh, to pick uh, fruit in the orchards over the weekends with their families. That's, that, that was entertainment in the, in the 40s. Um, so in that way, you know, I, I have to rely on facts. Um, we'll talk, uh, this discussion I'm sure will continue. The other, the other way um, that I want to come at this question is matters of construction. Uh, so process I've just spoken about and matters of construction. So, you know, um, I just, uh, you know, this young man in the front row is wearing a red, red shirt. Um, and so as a novelist, as a storyteller, if I were to describe this young man, he's wearing a sort of, uh, you know, a bright red shirt with uh, a dark three emblazoned on his uh, on his shoulder now that's a fact but when i say this young man is thinking when the session will end <laughs> i cross one crosses over into fiction and so you know these sorts of constructions are important uh, when I do my reportage. I wrote a piece recently for Caravan in, in, in India um, on Jamil Yusuf, um, and I called it sort of, I think it was called Karachi's Batman or Karachi's Bruce Wayne or something like that. And I had to be very conscious in the construction of that piece because um, I had to be very careful when, Jam when I was quoting Jamil Yusuf uh, to be very careful in um, in not editorializing his words. I, d I, I wanted him to speak for himself and if I were to editorialize his words and he speaks about very controversial issues, um, it would, I, I would cross over from, 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 from fiction, uh, from fact to fiction. And so in, it's not merely the process that is fundamental and important. It's, it's the actual construction of each paragraph which becomes very, very um, integral to this, this matter. Okay. So let me ask you, how is that different from, say, a historian like Edward Given who gives, imputes intent and motive and actually quotes Constantine having said certain things when there is no historical documentation for Constantine ever having said any of those things, just the things that he did or allegedly did. Or Herodotus who makes claims about Xerxes' speeches to his armies and his generals before they invade, right? The facts are there, there are certain things that did happen, but certainly the intent and the motive are unknown. So the historian in some ways does similar things to what the novelist does. Why should we believe one as history and think of the other only as fiction? <clears throat> I, you know, I read, I mean, you know, um, I know many historians uh, intimately. Um, I, um, I, you know, history can be thought of as a as as not a science or an art, but uh, not a science, but more of an art. Um, and history can also be thought as a variety of literature. Um, and uh, you know, there is a reason why each story, each historical event, is retold every generation. Uh, you know, the fa the facts of 1947 are before us, but each generation writes the story again. Um, and it depends how the story is told, uh, depending on where you are on, on which side of the border, or if you're in North India or in South India. Um, so 
there's a reason why this story is retold each generation. Um, yeah, Rob? Well, I was going to say, I mean, the, the, <laughs> the, 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 same, the same is true, you know, t today, n n never mind given. I mean, we, we talk about the rise of narrative nonfiction and creative nonfiction, where an agreed set of events is shoehorned into a story, and the writer will take liberties with exactly that, um, trying to guess someone's motive or put, put thoughts in someone's head as, as best they can. And there are writers who kind of specialise in doing this deliberately and may, may advertise their work as a work of, of fiction, but, uh, or they may say it's based on a true story. You know, it's something that, f that filmmakers have done for a long, long time, but, but writers are sort of deliberately blurring the lines in order to tell a better story often. So it's not, it's, it's not just the histories, it's, you know, it's, it's contemporary nonfiction as well. So uh, let me just, sorry, um, I had another thought. Uh, several years ago, I was compelled by some friends of mine to watch a movie featuring um, that pretty young boy who plays a crusader. Um, Kingdom, Kingdom of, of Heaven. Kingdom of Heaven. Yeah. And so I was watching this movie and, um, and realized that sort of I had not read about the Crusades recently and got curious. So I picked up Holt's uh, account of the Crusades. Holt is a, sort of a neo-Orientalist. Uh, he taught at Oxford and uh, he writes a very dry factual account of the Crusades. And then I felt there was some, something missing. So I, re I picked up another book and that was Runciman's trilogy. Uh, he's an old school Orientalist and he actually attributes um, thoughts and uh, characterizes people with adjectives, the brave young Kurd who took on Peter the Hermit and so on. And then I felt I was still missing something. And so this is the same sort of historical event. And I then picked up um, the Crusades Through Arab Eyes by Malouf. And so, you know, I was trying, one was trying to triangulate at the truth and each, each author had done extensive research, but they, their truths were different. And in that way, I think the truths here are pretty straightforward. Framji Minwala, Rob Krilly, and H.M. Nakvi sitting on stage. But if we were to hand out pieces of paper as, as exercises, the account of this uh, event, uh, this, this session will be very different. The Tribune misquoted me yesterday. Um, uh, the account. Bloody you know, journalists. They, <laughs> they have their own account. Everybody has their own account. Yeah. Rob, many people say that journalism is in some ways a first draft of history. And uh, Hussein just described his research and the process of his research in almost journalistic terms. Would you say that that is partly what you do and the way in which you did the work on Saving Darfur is similar to the way he works on researching his novels? Yes. I mean, I guess, I mean, I would never say I write the first draft of history. I think that's kind of <laughs> rather, a rather pretentious way of looking at journalism. Um, I mean, but, but certainly in terms of that gathering of facts, and funny enough, I bumped into HM at, um, can I say the location? <laughs> right, I, I, was, I visited 9-0 last year before the elections to interview MQM, <laughs> and I bumped into a famous Karachi novelist researching <laughs> his, 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 his next novel. So, um, did they give you a pictorial history of Altaf Hussein to take away? I missed nice that. coffee table book? They, 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 they do that with foreign journalists. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, so I have the oddest coffee table book ever, um, but 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 I mean I, I guess yes it is. I mean I'm I'm, I'm I mean I'm, I'm often struck by some of the, the detail in the novels I love, and it comes back to this building, this this world of um, plausibility. Um, and if you take um, um, a, a book, I mean take a book, a writer like Frederick Forsyth, who was a, a journalist, who was was an Africa correspondent, uh, and, and I mean I, I mean I, I love his his novels from the the seventies, the, the Day of the Jackal, in mm. particular, um, the Dogs of War where he basically put together a coup plot in order to research his, his, his book. He put around word that he was going to overthrow the government of Equatorial Guinea, and in that way was able to meet mercenaries, understand how they operate, get the characters for his book, and all, all the, I mean, the beautiful thing about his book is the way it all kind of fits together. The weapons, how they get them there, the money they need, who they need to bribe. Um, and it was all a bit awkward, because about a year after that, a whole load of people were arrested for trying to put together a, a coup attempt in Equatorial Guinea. So he had to do some pretty fast explaining. Um, um, so, so, I mean, I think a lot of the techniques are, are the same. And I mean, probably the, 
the, the difference between a novelist and a, and a non-fiction writer might, I don't know, might come at the sort of um, uh, conception stage, where the idea comes from, what you want to achieve. But in terms of actually the nuts and bolts of, of putting it together, I think a lot of it is the same. Not the I invent things, but the, the way you find characters through whom you can tell the story, the way in which you find pivotal events in which to hang your writing on, the idea of needing some kind of crisis and, it, and, its, res, and its resolution. I mean, you know, the obvious stuff of beginning, a middle, and an end. And, 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 in, and you've got to go to places and you've got to get the sand between your toes in order to, whether, and whether you're dealing with, 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 with fiction or non-fiction, it's just got to feel right. And, and the best novels are the ones that just, just kind of feel right. I mean, it might not be the, I'm not, I'm not always a great plot man, but it's, it's, got a, it's got a feel. I mean, you know, I love um, Mohammed Hanif's case of exploding mangas. I've got no idea what Pakistan was like under General Zia. But that just kind of feels like it, it, how it would have been. Um, Rob, uh, if you were to write, if, when you write, you write obviously in the third person. Yeah. Now, if you were to insert yourself in, in a story, do, do you cross over? I don't, I mean, I would, I, if, 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 if you were using the, if you were using I. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I avoid that at all costs. I mean, in, 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 my, in my newspaper journal, in Saving Darfur, um, my heroic romp through Africa, uh, I did put myself in the story just because it needed my experience of being naive when I first looked at the story and my gradual sort of realization of how it worked. I just wanted, I wanted to try and put myself in the story as a kind of every man in, in, in some ways. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but I, you know, for me, um, a non-fiction writer who has to put themselves in the story, my, my example aside, is, is failing in what they do because, um, you know, unless you're writing a memoir or something, the story's not about you. And, and I think there are always clever ways of saying you were there and you saw it. I mean, without using, I, I, you know, I just, I'm allergic to putting I or me I, in the I story know, but for a start. The, but the question is theoretical yeah. uh, in, in that, is it just merely a matter of construction? Is the, from, is the switch from third person to the first person, you're telling the same story. If you were to do an exercise when, in a, with an article and you just put I in, will, 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 will you cross over? The, the, I think the whole thing would break down. You know, my job is to be an observer. And it's like, you know, the, the, in cinema, the wall between the, um, uh, the, the film and the audience. I mean, there are times when you can break it down to, you know, uh, to make a point and you can play with it. But I think if, you know, if you're reading it, if I'm writing a 500 word story about a bomb going off in Peshawar, the whole idea would, would fall down. I'm an outsider here, I'm an observer. Um, and, and so, wouldn't any, I mean, I'm sure in exactly the same way that you are when you put a novel together. But so, what would you do with writers um, like? Uh, what we were discussing over email, uh, David Eggers and what is the what, who inserts himself into that narrative, or um, the author of The Killing Fields um, about the Vietnam War, who also inserts himself into his narrative reporting. Uh, there, may, there may be circumstances in which the journalist is the story. You know, I, I can understand that. And I think Dave Eggers is, is actually really interesting. And in my five years in Africa, I read a lot of books on Africa. His, his What is the What is, is, is by far and away the best. And it tells the story of Sudan really beautifully. And um, I mean, for those of you that, that don't know, it's a story of one of the lost boys. These were, these were young boys in South Sudan who lost their parents during the Civil War, or, or maybe were separated from them in, in the 90s, and then walked hundreds of miles across the border to Ethiopia, where they found safety in, in refugee camps, only to then be recruited by the southern rebels and w walked back to fight the war. Um, and it's an extraordinary account. And, and, and Dave Eggers, in, in interviews, said, he, he struggled to, to he, he, it's based on, on interviews with a particular character, Valentino Achak Deng. Uh, and it was based on weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks of interviews. And, and Dave Eggers said he just couldn't write it without inserting his own voice. Uh, as, he couldn't write it as somebody else's biography, essentially. And that's why he then turned it into a, 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 a fictionalized account. He, 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 he produced it as a novel. And therefore, the que you know, questions of voice sort of didn't matter. And actually, you know, I think that's something Dave Eggers can do. I don't know how many other writers will be skillful enough to be able to tell someone else's story through, with their own voice. So, so you know, a couple of years ago, um, <coughs> there was a book called Man Gone Down. Um, I uh, will not recall the, uh, the, the author off the top of my head, but it received the Impact Award, which is the largest literary award in the world. It's about half a million dollars, I believe, and I think the prize is awarded from Dublin. <coughs> 
he um, wrote a memoir and pitched it to a publisher and the publisher rejected it. And he then went to another publisher and pitched it as fiction. <laughs> and it got accepted and won the largest literary award in the world. So um, that, you know, that, 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 that for me is, ex exemplifies this, 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 this matter. Um, yeah, but you could also reverse it. So there's a very famous book by a Pakistani politician, which is largely fiction, but which was pitched as uh, autobiography. It was also ghost written, um, and um, so, and it was published because it was a Pakistani politician, not because it was fiction, even though it is. Um, so, how, how do you? I mean, in a sense, and and I, I think they're think of thinking of a different book. The one I'm thinking about is Daughter of Destiny. Uh, <laughs> Um, uh, so how do you actually draw these lines? Where do you actually begin to um, assess what is truthful, what is not, what is factual, what is not? How do we, when we use narrative to tell stories, narrative, narrative is almost always, almost always involves certain kinds of fictional strategies and techniques in order to tell these stories, whether it's journalism or history or novels. A, a sort of neat little uh, axiom that comes to mind is that fiction is a lie that tells the truth. Yes. Uh, and um, uh, fiction has to work in a way that non-fiction doesn't. Um, you've got to make fiction believable, whereas non-fiction works. If you see something in the newspaper, you believe it to be true. But I would say it doesn't have to be true. Um, I'll give you an example. I mean, I'm, I'm obsessed by guidebooks, particularly guidebooks in places that wouldn't necessarily attract a lot of tourists. So I just picked, picked up the Jumbo Karachi Guide. And um, I turned to page 61, and this page is titled, Karachi Becomes Polio-Free in 2012. <laughs> uh, now, I mean, that's still a work of non-fiction, uh, but, but, but this is quite clearly wrong, and so it can be mistaken. Um, it can be based on conversations in which people mislead you. Um, it, it doesn't necessarily, I mean, the work of non-fiction doesn't necessarily have to be true. And there's a, there's a massive industry um, in, in the UK and in the US on uh, very odd non-fiction books about the Bible, trying to define, I mean, uh, as we saw in that, um, what's that awful Dan Brown book, The Da Vinci Code, all that sort of, all that sort of stuff. These are non-fiction books, but based on utter bilge. So, so I think non-fiction doesn't necessarily have to be true, but I think it has to present itself as being true. Can we turn our attention just for a minute to film? So there have been a spate of recent films in the last 10 years about historical events. And I'm thinking of films like Argo, th films like Zero Dark Thirty, uh, films like Lincoln, uh, which purport to tell real stories, but which are fundamentally fictional. Um, uh, Ridley Scott's film Gladiator about uh, ancient Rome, in which we believe that this is what ancient Rome looks like, though Ridley Scott himself has said that I had to change every detail because if I actually put the accurate details in, nobody would believe the film. Um, uh, how do we deal with, um, especially in our image-saturated culture, how do we deal with images that purport to tell us the truth even though those images are largely fictional or false? You know, I mean, uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, for instance, I haven't seen it, but it, it is an adaptation. Uh, it's, it, it doesn't quite present itself as, as the canonical truth. Um, I, find, I find movies, cinema virete, uh, much more interesting. You know, in 1991, there was this fabulous, one of the first films that I'd seen with, that toyed with such ideas was Man Bites Dog about a Belgian assassin and a TV crew following him. Um, and he would, and at some juncture, the crew started hanging out with the assassin. And, uh, you know, that, that, that has now become uh, pervasive, the sort of, uh, in, in reality television, Big Brother or these, 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 these sorts of programs are actually scripted, but the way that they're shot uh, 
uh, s suggests that everything is real. Um, so I find I find this this particular trope in in uh, in contemporary filmmaking. Uh, uh, I think it pertains more to this conversation, and I don't have anything particularly profound to say about it because I'm not a filmmaker. Rob really is. Well, uh, I, mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's interesting. I mean, films have always been able to get away with based on a true story, and and no one really complains. And often films are sexed up, you know, whether it's a, a thriller or a, a war film or something. You know, you might condense the time frame down. Um, you might have composite characters. Um, you might make the CIA the heroes when we know it was actually the Canadians that did it all in uh, Argo. Um, um, and, I mean, uh, uh, interestingly, one of the films up for the Oscar this year, um, 19 Years a Slave, um, based on the memoir. 12 years. Tw 12 Years a Slave. 19 years would be better the sequel. One, the sequel. Yeah, 12, 12 Years a Slave. Um, um, I mean, I haven't, I haven't read the memoir, but, but apparently the scenes of violence have actually been toned down because it was so utterly horrific. And, and normally that, that shift goes, goes the other way. Um, and and th this year in particular, there seems to have been so many, so many films, um, um, saving, uh, saving Mr. Banks, um, Captain Phillips. Um, th you know, we've had a whole... S and I don't, you know, I don't know if that's the impact of reality TV... Um, you know, maybe the, uh, come back to the impact of 9/11. That actually, the real world is so odd and so strange. Um, I mean, Frederick Forsyth, when you know, when he's been interviewed about what he's working on now and what he's done before, uh, the Dogs of War was set in a fictional country, and now he says he won't, he won't, he won't do that because the, the world is so strange. So I, I mean, I, I don't know if there's just so, you know, the, as you say, truth is, is is stranger than fiction. Has something changed? I mean, I'm, I don't follow cinema closely enough to know that if this is a new trend or not. But if, as an observer, it feels like it. Well, certainly the relationship between documentary film and fictional film is being blurred in similar ways. Um, and so um, recent documentaries that have in some ways constructed, especially, say, Michael Moore's documentaries, that construct a very specific argument in relation to a selective, uh, very selective um, uh, incorporation of facts that he agrees with, but not the ones that he doesn't, which is very similar to, of course, something the Bush administration administration did around WMDs. So, in, 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 you know, in the ways in which we actually, I think part of my question is in the ways in which we actually experience and then understand the real world outside of us, how much of what we understand is always partial and always in many ways wrong. You know, it's all, I mean, the nature of reality hasn't changed, but our, our understanding, our consciousness of reality has recently changed. You know, the words discourse and narrative you hear on Hamid Mir's show now. <laughs> so that suggests that, you know, you know you've know, you got a JUIF spokesman who's saying, this is our narrative and that is their narrative. I mean, at, at, that, at that level, there is this consciousness that reality is malleable and the narrative of the JUIF is different from the narrative of the MQM. Um, and so, I mean, Ten years ago, or when I was growing up and I was sort of brought up by PTV, the word narrative was not part of the lexicon. Uh, now it's sort of uh, common currency. So, Rob, does that mean that there really isn't anything such as nonfiction? <laughs> um, uh, well, hmm, possibly. <laughs> um, I mean, I think I mean the journalist trick is always to strive for balance. So, if all sides are lying to you, quote them all. I mean. <laughs> And, and you know what? You won't actually get any closer to truth. But I'm not sure you can really hope for very much more. Um. Okay. Should we... I don't know what, how we're doing on time, but perhaps we can get some questions on this. You want to... Questions? Young lady up front. Um, is there, a mic or should I there is a mic somewhere. Um, did I break for questions too early? No, no, no. Oh, no, we did it. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, you've touched on this briefly, but if you could uh, speak at this uh, at some length again. Um, at what point do you think is it all right for uh, the fiction writer perhaps to be autobiographical? And at what point is it a cop out? Like, is it at all okay or should, should the fiction writer be able to steal from reality? <laughs> 
I, you know, uh, philosophically feel that all fiction is autobiographical. So, Mother of God, okay. Um, you know, there are obvious examples like uh, Salinger's um, uh, Catcher in the Rye is, is very obviously uh, autobiographical. Um, and there are not so obvious uh, examples. Nabokov's Humbert Humbert in Lolita is, a ver is some sort of permutation of Nabokov. I don't think Nabokov had a proclivity for prepubescent women. Uh, girls, but the 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 persona of Humbert Humbert is a, of a European uh, who has these uh, certain aesthetic uh, cultural sensitivities. So, in those two examples, they're far ends of the spectrum. Both are autobiographical. But I would go a step further and claim that Isaac Asimov's uh, Space Trilogy or Arthur C. Clarke's work, which is science fiction, is also autobiographical. These, there is no, there, you know, in that they have to rely on their realities. They have to rely on their sensibilities. So, you know, all fiction is somewhat autobiographical. Um, and, you know, I, I you know, I, I, I feel that um, in that way this question is, it's, an, it's, it's a question that comes to everybody's mind, but it's not a sophisticated way of thinking about how fiction is constructed. I, you know, anybody who writes fiction has to draw on their realities. I do it in a very different way. I actually do research. I have claimed that I lack imagination. Um, and that's why I have to rely on my reality. But I think all authors fundamentally do. Yeah, yeah, that's the novelist, and I would agree. I mean, I think everything has got to... And, and, pro, and to a certain extent, even for a non-fiction writer, everything ultimately is mediated by your own experience. Um, so it's going to be have, have a bit of the writer in there always. Uh, just for the record, Homeboy is about... I've done some calculations, and it's about 14% autobiographical. <laughs> <laughs> Over there, gentlemen. Ah, okay. Uh, in your opinion, what part does personal bias and commercialism play in fictionalizing any kind of journalism or films or whatever you want to write or do? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, this, uh, you, you've always, you, I mean, I always think about my audience. And um, when I'm writing a story uh, for a newspaper, that might be the editor or it might be the readership of the Daily Telegraph. Similarly, when I w was looking at writing a book, I, I tried to pick the subject with the very smallest audience so that nobody would buy my book. But, but the, the audience will always be there. And, and certainly if something's going to be turned into a film, there's huge amounts of money involved. So, you, you know, it's got to, um, you've got to have some way of recouping that. So, um, you know, and, and I think probably you could look at literary trends and point to what's sexy at the moment and know what books are going to sell and there'll be pressure from publishers to produce that kind of work. I mean, I, I don't, that's no secret. Can I, can I ask you a question? Sure. Um, there seems to be this, as far as this, this is concerned, there seems to be a trend amongst foreign correspondents who spent time in South Asia to write novels. So Amy <laughs> Waldman has come out with one. I think Owen Bennett Jones has come out with a thriller. Do you have a novel in you? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's very much in me and going to stay in stay in me no i mean but but i mean uh, you know i do appreciate the difficulty of the novelist art because if i start with a blank piece of paper i can always phone three people up get a bunch of quotes and suddenly my page is no longer quite so blank i've you know uh, the idea of having to conjure the whole and you talk about the way you collect facts and you say you have no imagination i don't think that's true but um i, I think the idea of trying to start with a blank paper, piece of paper and create a believable world is really frightening so uh, I had a question regarding uh, what was said earlier about how the truth differs for everyone. And uh, as you, uh, well, it was implied, sort of, if I'm not wrong to that the truth or the non-fiction is strictly political 
in this regard. So what is the actual merit or the credit of actually pursuing that thing? Why shouldn't everything just be on the top of, uh, of the top of our head if we're all observers and the truth is going to be different on either side of the border? So uh, what is the actual merit of doing that? But this is what Fox News promotes, right? That truth is a matter of opinion. <coughs> and, you know, it is their opinion that counts. If we get, uh, if we enter that fantasy world, I think we, are, we enter into a significant, significantly more difficulty, both politically and socially, than if we say that truth is partial, which is something different, or truth is concrete and specific to its context, which is also something different, then truth just is different and all of our opinions matter. But, uh, but I think we're in a quite democratic age, you know, write a blog post, you know, anyone, anyone can do it to a certain extent. And, you know, tr this uh, interpretation, matters of interpretation uh, become uh, important in, in, uh, when, when trying to address these variety of questions. So, um, your reading of, uh, let's say, uh, the Bible uh, is going to be different from uh, some, uh, somebody else's reading of the Bible. So, it's not merely the truth of the Bible, but your interpretation of it, your understanding of it, the tools and the sensibilities that you bring to that reading uh, change, um, change the words on the page, change, change the sort of these, these profound truths in a very substantive way. You know, I mean, there, can I, there's some uh, radical contemporary theorists who say that, in fact, there is nothing that is real, that everything is a simulation of a simulation, um, and uh, French, uh, one of... The French say that. The French say that. <laughs> um, uh, but, you know, and then there's a trilogy of films that attempts to actually make that into a visual experience for us, and that is the Matrix trilogy, which really suggests that there is nothing real, even though at the end of the film it does suggest that, yes, there was this battle between Neo and some... Uh, computer force or technical or uh, what was it mechanical forces that somehow result resulted in some kind of stalemate or some kind of detente right um, but this is one of the central questions of our age what is real and what is not what can we believe and what would we not believe um, hello to add to what you just said I was just gonna ask that we've been discussing a lot about the structure of writing fiction and nonfiction but in terms of the impact do you think sometimes when you present nonfiction people are all they're looking for facts they know that you're presenting facts and so they have their guards up and they expect you to tell the truth and everything you present that oh it's biased but when you're reading fiction it doesn't claim to give you the truth so you're more open to interpretations and so getting through to the reader and showing the basic sentiment is easier. Do you feel that, or do you feel that it's equal? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I mean, I um, I find uh, novels are, are frequently a better way to get to understand a place than works of non-fiction. Um, I've, a friend of mine has just gone to Afghanistan, so I packed her off with a copy of Flashman. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but 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 you know, because you can con conjure that sense of time and place in a really powerful way. And I mean, I think if if somebody read your work of non-fiction and say, well, that's biased. You're, you're probably not doing it right. You, gotta, you should be more subtle than that. Um, I mean, I, I, my book about Darfur had, a, I, I think, quite a, a strong political argument, but I hope it dressed, I dressed it up in a way that was convincing to people. So, I mean, M Michael Moore is a polemicist. I mean, his stuff, you re either you agree with it or you don't, you know, and, and that's that. But I, but, I, but, I, but I do agree with your point that there's something very powerful about novels. I think that fiction and non-fiction complement each other. And so, um, if you were to read the 9-11 report, I think you get, you know, you get one version of reality. But if you are sort of curious and persistent, you should try to triangulate and read some, um, you know, one of the, the uh, you know, the, since I wrote Homeboy, there's been a, I, when I was writing Homeboy, there was not a single 9/11 novel. I thought I was doing something very brilliant, um, but since then, there's sort of a whole body of work that's emerged, and there's some fine novels that don't uh, that that people have not read, like um, um, Joseph O'Neill's Netherland, 
um, um, uh, for instance. So and so you know those reading a novel that is set in and around 9/11 and reading the 9/11 report. It, they complement each other. That exercise is more meaningful. And so with anything, I think you need to tr kind of, I like to triangulate when I have time and, and read three different histories on the same subject or, or read fact and fiction. They, they, they complement each other. Hello. Uh, I would just like to say that can we just draw a line between fiction and non-fiction and putting only, you know, religious books in, uh, for example, essays of Emerson in on one side and on the other side, we can have, you know, history plays and, in fact, facts and news and everything. Uh, or we can have the poetic license, you know, to change the meaning of fiction and non-fiction. Can, can I, I mean, history plays are really interesting and as, uh, part is, they're interesting partly because so much of many English students today believe that English history is the way that Shakespeare wrote it. And any historian knows that, in fact, English history is radically different. So Richard the Second, Richard the Third, excuse me, is not a hunchback monster. And Henry V did not make this rousing speech before the Battle of Agincourt. But people really do believe that these things happened. Um, this, is, so this is all news to me, I just <laughs> <laughs> they do. Uh, I mean, the, but there are film goers who believe that, you know, uh, Cleopatra looks like Elizabeth Taylor. And, um, <coughs> you know, I mean, uh, so it goes on and on and on. I mean, it, it, in a sense, our reality is in some way somebody else's fictional imaginative recreate or creation, or it has become in some ways. Um, so I don't think you can draw that line, is what I'm suggesting. Hello. Uh, my question is for uh, HM. As a fiction writer, is there sort of like a self-policing that you do imply on yourself, if any, uh, in molding the facts when uh, according to the context of your story? Uh, can you rephrase the question? Uh, do you, when you are writing something, do, how far do you go in terms of uh, molding whatever have you researched? Uh, according in according to in con in context with your story, how far do you go? Is it like um, you, you know, um, <clears throat> it's an interesting question, uh, and one can't really do any quantitative analysis. Though it can, uh, you know, I can't say that when I'm describing a, a building, ninety percent of it's, it is, is true. But I figure I wanted a different roof, so the ten percent on top is different. Um, there are, uh, you know, yeah, the, so I mean, quantitatively, I can't really tell you. Qualitatively, when I need to bend a street because the drama uh, to make a street shorter, I'll take a little bit of poetic license, not much again, because I, I, I like, I, I care for, you know, if I'm writing about Kar Karachi, the topography of Karachi is integral to it. So I won't, you know, for but if, if my protagonist has to run, uh, down the street, uh, and he gets winded before he, uh, if he before he reaches the end. I may shorten the street just a little bit, um, and I'd say maybe three percent or eight percent. And that's and that's my threshold. We have time for one more question. It's so more about the future. I mean, we have a tenuous line between fiction and non-fiction. How do you see it in the future? Does it get merged in more? And especially now with the technology like you have on-hand information. I mean, 9-11 has happened. You get something on Twitter or an email immediately. Do you think that's going to make it stronger? I mean, I, th I think that's a really fascinating question. We're all obsessed by reality TV. We all watched and observed the events of 9-11 ourselves directly. Do we need novelists to recreate it? I think, I think, the, I think the line between the two, I think the, the most interesting, exciting writing at the moment is the stuff that does blur the line. Uh, whether it's uh, Hilary Mantel doing her historical novels or Dave Eggers taking uh, memoirs and essentially fictionalizing them. So I, d I don't know what the future holds, but I, I think whatever happens... It's going to get it, more blurry. Now. Yeah, and, and things will keep continue to evolve. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody, thank you very much. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you. One announcement, sorry.
one announcement I'd like to make is that the U.S. Ambassador is going to be speaking in the Jasmine Hall right now at 2.45. If anybody wants to hear, please. Is that fact or fiction? 